So this is the, the, today's session is an informal conversation amongst us all. Um, increasingly, over the last the last nine months, I have been I have really been thinking about a couple of issues. And you heard me talk about it Thursday morning. How can we accelerate the pace for change? What's next for new urbanism? But but bigger than that, I think is reflecting on what the founders have done for the movement and for the organization. They started it 23 years ago, and we have two, two speakers here from, from the founders, Liz plater Zyberg and Peter Calthorpe. And uh, just uh, honestly, they don't know this, but they have been two heroes of mine for the last 15 years, and the fact that I get to introduce them and interact with them on this panel is just a dream come true. Liz, as you all know, is one of the co-founders of the Congress for the New Urbanism, as well as a founder of the design firm, uh, Dwani plater Zyberg. She's also been the dean at the University of Miami for the last 18 years. And she's an amazing person. Doesn't everyone have a story about the day they fell in love with Liz? That's, that's a story I hear all the time. And Peter, Peter Newsweek claimed, uh, Newsweek, he was deemed one of Newsweek's, you know, hold on, it was a great quote. Usually I don't read these introductions, but they're hilarious what Newsweek said about him. Yeah, Peter was named one of the, uh, one of the 25 innovators of the cutting edge by Newsweek wa magazine. I mean, th think about that, right? We, we, we are so accustomed to, to having this talent. Um, that we don't, we don't quite realize the brilliance that they have. I was talking to one of the um, core members of CNU last night, and I said, you have the curse of knowledge. You don't understand how brilliant you are. You just get up every morning, you know your flaws, you put on your pants one leg at a time. But you guys have done something remarkable. You have taken us to this point in time. But now it's up to the next generation. And let's be clear, I'm not calling it next gen, but the next generation, because it is everybody who has come after and the people who are the little ones running around. What are we, as the next generation, how are we going to accelerate the pace of change? It now becomes we are all bound by the charter. Absolutely. But the strategies and approaches that the founders have done will be by, necess by necessity different from what the next generation. We have to pick up the mantle and go forward, but what will that mantle be? So today's conversation, it's truly that, is a conversation between the founders and our amazing panel of the next generation, Eliza Harris, who I joke, Eliza, let me know when you're taking over so I can have my bags packed. <laughs> She's the director of urban solutions at Canaan, uh, Canaan. Associates, sorry, did, did we, was everybody else at the dance party last night? Okay. Um, she just got married a few weeks ago, uh, actually about a month and a half ago, but, but more than that, Eliza's one of the clearest innovative thinkers that I've had the pleasure of working with. A and perhaps, um, and Russ Preston, right, Russ Preston is another board member, and I'll tell you his title in a minute, which of course I will screw up, but let me tell you something about Russ that isn't on his agenda, uh, isn't on his, his bio, which I feel is just critical to who he is. He's stepping back and he's thinking about how can we develop in a more organic and authentic nature? What are those characteristics? How can we come together as a movement and start doing that? A absolutely groundbreaking. Alice Brown, I had the pleasure of, uh, of being at the, the Harvard, ah, gasp, uh, GSD, Graduate School of Design, when I was a Loeb Fellow and she was a graduate student. She absolutely impressed me with her quick wit, insight, and enthusiasm for new urbanism, enthusiasm for the movement. We have an amazing panel here. So what I want to talk about today, as I've said, is how, how can we take what the founders have done, take what you all have created and move forward. So my first question on this is, we're into our third decade as a movement and attention is turning to implementation to accelerate the pace of change. What do you all feel are the key implementation strategies going forward? So I'm gonna let you think about that while I lay out the ground rules. So first ground rule, we're all polite and nice to each other, but at the same time, feel free to interrupt each other Feel free to ask questions. If it gets too unruly, I don't think it will because it's Saturday and we're all a little tired from the dance party. So 
That's the question. What are the key implementation strategies for the next 25 years? Or moving forward? Okay, um, I need a pro to, uh, to coach me a little bit. Um, one of the key implementation strategies that we've heard a lot about is tactical urbanism, and Russ probably could speak to this better than I can. He's been doing that in Boston. Um, but a piece of that is taking from thinking about tactical urbanism as a cute thing that artists do or that the kids are doing to actually, um, and Jennifer Krauss has done a great job of, of articulating this, how we think of this as organizational change, how we think of pilot projects as a way to accelerate um, the way they did in New York City, the implementation of very, very large scale, very expensive products by pilot piloting them on an inexpensive basis, which could be $500 if you're a, a advocacy group, or it could be a million dollars if you're talking about the middle of Manhattan, but whatever it is, it's a much, much smaller scale than the final product. Don't you think we're at a point where past pilot projects? Why do we need pilot projects? Why can't we just go to scale with what we already have done? So um, there's, there's a whole movement that came out of Japanese auto manufacturing called Lean, not Lean Urbanism, although it's related, but um, Lean Startup is a book that talks about it. And if you're going to implement things at scale, there's going to have to be a testing phase. And obviously, we've tested the basic concept of new urbanism, and that's not something that I think we need to test again. But whenever you're in a particular place, and we believe in context that there are contextual solutions, there's always going to be idiosyncrasies. And before you put down $2 million or $5 million worth of pavement, maybe you should know if that corner clip is going to actually work. Or even if we know, maybe we need to be able to prove it to the community before we start to have that large-scale investment. Let me interrupt also, here. You know, it's hard to interrupt when somebody's holding the mic. You'd have to rip it out of their hands. So we don't, we don't get to do that, unfortunately. Uh, I, I'd like to just back up for a second. First, it's sobering. I mean, you really know you're old if the only quote you can find about me is from a dead magazine. I mean, it's, it's from no the bio you gave me. You know, no. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Secondly, uh, I, I, uh, I am really excited uh, to be here this time. Uh, for years, I've backed away from seeing you, and it's partly because I wanted, I felt that the founders should get out of the way and make a lot more space for other people to come in. And so uh, I thought that was the right thing to do, and I think that uh, that's starting to happen and is happening, and I'm really excited to see everybody that's here and the kind of level of energy and interest and uh, diversity. So I think that transition is well underway and is really healthy and it's great. Um, and so I'm re-energized to tell you the truth about the whole enterprise. Uh, specific to this question, uh, um, you know, I, I think that, as I said before, you got to attack this, this issue on multiple levels simultaneously. And that's the whole nature of urbanism, is you never get to solve one problem at a time. Because everything you do has all sorts of other consequences. And so you've got, always got to think in many metrics, many variables. And so even the small projects has many, have many implications. And so I think they're you know, really powerful. Now, this question of what were you saying, what, you know, whether we're doing pilots or studies, uh, I think that there's still studies to be done. Uh, for example, in California, we just won another big uh, step forward, which is cap-and-trade money can now be used for land use and transit. Originally, the dollars coming out of climate mitigation had to go to technology, a, a solar farm or a wind farm, or something where you could actually count the, the, uh, the tons of carbon uh, against it. But that's a huge pot of money that can now be used for the kinds of stuff we believe in. And the question is, should it be small pieces or big, big chunks? Big chunks. Are and we still at it's the pilot all, phase and or are we scaling up? But there's research that needs to be done to prove out the capacity of those investments. If you're going to get the dollars, you have to prove the nexus. And so there's still research to be done. Well, and the pilot is going to be scaled to the size of the project. So the pilot for a regional a regional project might be an entire town. The, project, the pilot for um, a street might be just a, one day on that block. So pilot, pilots can happen. They could be a billion dollar pilot if it's a regional. Russ keeps trying to say something. 
or L? I think one issue, so I live in Boston and that's my experience. Um, in Boston, we take the term pilot and we use it to say, it's okay people, it might not be permanent. We're gonna try this crazy thing and then you can let us know if you should, we should remove it later. So sadly, the term pilot doesn't even always mean there's going to be more of it. It means we can get away with doing something crazy precisely one time. And so I think one thing that it's really important that urbanists push for is to say that this isn't a, a maybe we can do it once, it's a we can continue to do this and we can expand. And going into that pilot, knowing what expansion looks like. Um, and then the other problem with context sensitive is that you know, Boston thought parklets looked cool, but no one locally in Boston was building parklets, so the city built its own parklets and called it a pilot, and no one liked them. And so they just kind of are, there are four, there were four, there still are four. The pilot persists, but that's, that's all it is. So I think going in knowing this is the right thing for this place, and when we say pilot, we do mean there will be more to come. So, Peter, um, I don't think anybody uh, has ever felt that you pulled back. We have always felt as if you've been here. Um, uh, and we've been keeping track of you through your China presentations. Um, but you know, everything that we're talking about, I always think back about the organization and what the organization, what CNU can do for the work that you all are, we all are doing. Um, and it's clear that we're in the business of culture change. Um, whether it's projects or educating people, tactical urbanism is a kind of educational step in the process of implementation. Um, and that takes decades. Um, I often wonder whether there's not some way that we can share the best practices and the experience better with the people who are always new to the game, because that's part of culture change. There's always somebody new who's just beginning to consider thinking about things or is still trying to convince someone. And um, in this age of communication, that's still a challenge. How do we get these things um, accessible? And I think in the last session, one of the questions was, well, now we've heard all of this, these great statistics and news, we can each of us think of at least 100 people or towns that probably need to hear it. How do we get it out? I have heard from a number of core members, including founders, that we should stay small, we should stay elite. So if we are going to win the war on sprawl, if we're going to accelerate the pace of change, do we stay small and elite? Do we expand the tent to bring in more people, and how do we do that? Russ, talk about Ted. Um, I'm moving a little slow this morning, everyone, so give me a minute while I ramp up. So uh, is this better? Yeah. The, um, the idea of, of how do we implement, I think, is, is always on the front of my mind. I think in Boston, you know, the story in Boston is that the parklets, parklets were not delivered in a real sincere way. Um, for example, one of them was placed across the street from a park. So the, the, the sheer understanding of how you deploy these tactics is not, is not shared within the larger what would call, you know, everyone in Boston would call themselves an, ur an urbanist too, but the, the practice is very different. So I think as, as I look at that question, do we stay elite or do we expand the tent? I don't think it's an either or, I think it's a both. And, um, you know, for me in Boston, I think, you know, we thought a lot about this over the last five or six years that, you know, tactical urbanism was just a name that was applied to a much larger thing that was happening. It was, it was in the air, and we just kind of grabbed it and labeled it. Um, you know, and that, I think, if you pull back even further, there's this increased interest in people actually improving their own place. And this you know, old word, I think it's civicism, which is kind of this resurgence of you know, we want to actually control our own destiny and our own neighborhood. So I think that's, for, for us, uh, a real opportunity to, to get down to the level of, the, of people and dealing with it at, at a ground plane that is, you know, it's very diff different than regional planning or transit planning, but it's, you know, a lot, I just see this because a lot of our practice in Boston is neighborhood planning at the, at the scale of the block, the building. And that's where I think you can really make places um, more authentic if you do that right. 
and I think us as CNU needs to develop better tools for doing that in cities. Because I, you know, I look to our larger practice across the movement and see that um, there are still a lot of gaps in how do we handle large, dense places at a neighborhood scale. And I think you know, in Boston we can talk more about that. So. Um, and in terms of tactical urbanism, one thing that's often missing is what Steve Muzan's always talking about with architecture. It's the we did this because, we do this because. Same thing in my city, they did parking day in front of a park. And there are other reasons you can do parking day. You can do it to narrow a street. There can be a number of reasons, but no reason is not, is not a good one. Um, you have to have a hypothesis that you're trying to answer when you do a pilot project. And if there's not a hypothesis, then how do you know if it succeeded or not? And that's one of the, you know, so that's a training element in terms of, like I said, institutionalizing this. There's actually a lot more to it than, you know, the mural or painting something cute. It, it actually, if you do it in that way, in sort of the scientific method way, it can have really important results. And the, the other thing I was hoping, um, I got this from Russ, so I'll steal it, um, is he, you know, he turned me on to TED Talks. And TED Talks is you know, a way of doing a conference. It's actually an incredibly elite conference that happens in one location. And it's very expensive, it's hard to get into. But they have their videos free to the world. And in part because the conference is expensive, they're able to publish them at very high quality so people can see them. So there are other ways of getting content out um, besides having people come here. I think the expectation that people want to, you know, that 10,000 people want to come and meet us here in Dallas is not necessarily realistic. And even if it was, there would be drawbacks to that. So there are ways that we can, we can work at multiple levels, whether it's through chapters, whether it's through video and online engagement. Well, I think that, I mean, that's emblematic of where we are. I mean, you go to the CNU's website, current web, old website. Yeah, it's uh, it's, it's old. We're, we're launching yeah, a new one. New one. But if you look at the sort of marketing material, how we talk about new urbanism over the last you know, 20 years, it's been pictures of, of, of projects, pictures of people, you know, in the projects. But us as a movement, you know, I come to CNU because of the smart, the brains and the, and the, the community that's here and the knowledge that's with this, the people. So I think uh, us going forward is, is, as, as an organization, I think much more about how, how can we understand the new tools we have to create and how do we connect to a larger coalition of people that are thinking about that. And the Hold on, I, want, I want to push back on the tactical just for a bit. I'll, I'm going to play a little devil's advocate. So one thing that I, one characteristic of the founders have been this deep, deep implementation. You know, Peter is out in China designing communities, designing cities for millions of people. And so we do tactical urbanism. We, we activate a street for one day, a weekend, Changing, permanently changing and make better places is hard work. It requires codes, changes, a whole slew of different bits. Why, wh what's the advantage of doing tactical? Wh why go there? Times Square. I think there's Times Square, but I also think that there is a little bit of a question of who's doing tactical urbanism where. So I've followed Russ's projects both in Boston and in Providence and in Somerville. And I almost feel like the Providence scale was like the most fascinating one that Russ has ever shared with me or that I followed because he was going into a place where he was teaching an entire city that their city could be different because he took this downtown area, he reshaped it in a particular way, he actually got to watch people watch it evolve and it was a place that wasn't already perfect, like it had good bones but it had serious walkability problems. One of the things in Boston and Somerville that's a little bit more ironic is that Ultimately, like, you can always walk there, and people have always walked there. Like, so we're going and we're trying to just kind of remind people that they can walk there, which is a different exercise than, than showing someone in a Times Square or the center of Providence that, like, your city can be radically different. And I think if you do it in that central location, you educate a different group of people than the neighborhood. And sometimes the neighborhood needs to be educated because they are convinced that they've come to this special pocket where they don't have to change, but the downtown can change. And sometimes the downtown is important because then it gets the news and it gets the buzz and it gets a whole new set of people to do it. So I think there's a question of scale and there's a question of city type that is really important in deciding what your project is and how important it's going to be in making greater change. Peter wants to jump. You know, don't forget that we have three scales in the charter. And what I like about uh, tactical urbanism is, it's, and we've tried many times to get to the block and the building scale, but you know, uh, CNU has had a bulge We've had the, you know, the middle scale, the neighborhood scale has been our bulge and it's our identity. 
uh, and the identity has been powerful in that we really have big solutions, but also it's debilitating, you know, the seaside stereotype and things like that, that it's suburban new town, things like that. And we've always had these three scales, but the focus has been kind of at the center, at least from the media looking out in. And the fact that you guys are picking this up and kind of taking it to the street, I think is a powerful new step, just because it shifts the world's understanding of CNU. And, you know, and that, I think, opens a huge set of opportunities. Because if you can actually shake off the stereotypes and keep moving to new ideas and new things and demonstrating different scales of, of enterprise, you revitalize what's going on here. So I think it's fabulous. And I also totally agree that, you know, putting up something that just makes people realize, oh, we could really get rid of that parking strip there and we could do something useful with it. Even if it goes away, it plants an idea which then crops up in a million other places like a health, like a healthy virus, is there such a thing? So I would say uh, right on to all that. Well, I think on the Providence example, I mean, you know, Buff always would say, we have to facilitate the conversation, you know, where we just played, we connected the dots, I think. And you know, I remember walking around Kennedy Plaza years ago with Buff and thinking, you know, what do we do about this? And that was, you know, that was, we couldn't just come out with a pretty master plan and a rendering and say, we want to rip out the bus station and make this, you know, Providence's Central Park, the heart of the, of the, of the state. And so that was, you know, we had to modify our a normal sort of approach would be let's master plan it and let's put the renderings out and let's try to, you know, change people's minds. So th rather than doing that, we went to a much more organic way of doing, which was figure out how to throw a beer garden and live concerts in the park and get people into the space and build a coalition around it. And that takes uh, more, it takes more time, but I think it's able to, you know, having done this a few more times now in, in Somerville, it changes the conversation. It's not the defensive, don't do this, don't, I don't want, what are you doing to my city? It ends up being a much more collaborative and a much more uh, uh, successful process where you get funding and I've seen projects now go, you know, from just an idea to getting on a capital budget in years rather than a decade. The, the tactical urbanism pilot step doesn't replace the implementation. It replaces the fourth version of the planning study that's been sitting on the shelf for a few decades. And that's often yeah. the case. So it, think of it as a planning study, not as an implementation step. It's really just a study in real time and real space. Yeah, I was just pushing, you know. All right, so, so absolutely on the tactical urbanism. So now let me push on something else, particularly on the examples that you all have used. And I know that the, the I know a lot of the work of our core members has been, you know, seaside, a resort community for, frankly, you know, a certain socioeconomic demographic. You know, a lot of our TNDs, traditional neighborhood developments, have been in, in, a, in more fluent and monocultures. And, and if we look out into our audience, we don't see a whole heck of a lot of diversity. That has been our history. Moving forward, what do you think we should do and how do you think we should do it? Well, you know, there was a, a kind of call to action in the plenary of um, Friday morning, um, in which I think many of us who attended that session probably thought we need to be reminded about this, but in fact, many of us have worked in those conditions and we wish that talk had started at the end and moved forward. And the reason I'm saying that is because one of the things that our, the minds of this organization I think have been pretty good at is looking forward um, and trying to imagine what's ahead um, or what's happening right now in some way that may not be visible that we need to be addressing. And um, certainly our conversations about climate change this morning um, and later today uh, will be addressing that, but there's th there is the big social issue of the structure of society in this country, if not the world. Um, and that actually, it's not a design issue, obviously. Um, that's about addressing finan a finance structure, a kind of economic structure that I think we have people within our fold and certainly connected to us that could help us address that because um, in the end, that's what it comes down to is how, and the, the recession that we just came out 
of was based entirely on that issue. Um, and so I think it would be interesting if we found the things that we should be addressing, much in the way that we've been ahead of the game before, and said, who should we ask to address these things among us and bring it back to the membership? Because we have the capacity to do that in a multidisciplinary way in which really very few other groups do. I think it's also, so this is, I read a while back a study that said that during the Vietnam War, the African American population in America was opposed to the war long before white college students decided they were opposed to the war. And that this story sort of disappeared afterwards when certain people became famous for having protested and stopped it and brought an end to it. And the statistics got sort of re-uncovered around 2000. It was like, hmm, let's look at this. And my sense is that the people who stayed in cities when lots of people left and built suburbia, some of them were really poor. Not the people in the projects, but the people who retained their homes. They were not well off. They built communities in cities in what was left of a downtown core. And they're kind of annoyed that a bunch of white people from the suburbs are coming back and telling them how to build community in their community. Because I've been to a lot of conversations about gentrification and displacement, and they recognize that it's wealthy or middle-class black people that are displacing poor black people, and it's wealthy and middle-class white people that displace white people. Like, it's not even strictly a race issue, but it is a question of this, like, working class that was in the city, that liked the city, that found a home in the city when a lot of people left, who are really annoyed that a lot of people are coming back and telling them this isn't what cities are supposed to look like or do, and they're not really being part of the conversation. And so I think that there's a tension there that um, is very strong in a place like South Boston, if you've been there, but that you, that you find that people are like, but we liked it here, what the bleep are you doing? And so I think going in and talking to people, each of those people has the thing that they like, particularly when they traveled somewhere else in that like one or two times they traveled, because if they're poor, they didn't travel as much as we did. They didn't go to Copenhagen and fall in love with the bike lanes. But there is a question of like going there and being like, okay, when you travel, what did you like about that place you traveled to? What do you like about your community? What's the community hub for you? Like that's a very different kind of conversation to start with people than to come in with your plan of gentrification or your plan of, you know, your tactical urbanism and just say like, we're changing. What do you think of it? Because their, their answer is just gonna be, that's not what we want because that's not what we know. Um, and I think that's a, it's not even a strictly a race thing, but it is about who's been in the city for a long time. Well, and I, I appreciated um, what both of you are saying. I appreciate you saying we need to involve people in the conversation and um, Liz saying that it's about addressing the issues people care about, not about trying to meet some sort of demographic goal. And then the demographic goal follows the addressing the issues that people care about. Um, and there's also, I think, a cultural issue. There was a discussion in one of the architecture sessions earlier this week about, you know, why isn't there more diversity in architecture schools? And I could speak to at least one of those, not personally, but I had a, a cousin who went to an architecture school, and I tried to convince him to go to a vernacular or classical architecture school because I knew that that would match his values better. Um, but he's not a type A personality. He's not going to, you know, go out and be part of that critique culture that eats each other alive, you know, eats its own young. Um, and so as long as you have that kind of culture, I would suspect, you know, not all women are the same, certainly, and there are some women that thrive in that culture, but whether it's nature or nurture, a lot of women don't thrive in that culture, so as long as there's that really aggressive culture, I think you probably will not have as many women in architecture schools, and I can't speak to racial diversity, but maybe that's, you know, maybe there are cultural issues there, too, that are not even the issues so much as just the, um, the social culture of the schools or even of our, our organization. So as, as CNU, one of, the, one of the, its strongest characteristics is that it's multidisciplinary, right? It's just not about architecture or urban design or transportation engineers or, you know, the, the slew of all the, all the professions that I have just left out and for which I apologize. But it's multidisciplinary. You know, I'm a policy wonk and, and I'm here. So as we talk about increasing the diversity, as we talk about including more people in the conversation, and absolutely I need to agree with Liz that I, this is having robust conversations with communities from the ground up in the exact way that Antwi was talking about yesterday has been a core tenant of what we've done. Uh, and, and a lot of the, many of our members have been implementing those practices throughout. So it's not as though we, we haven't been doing it. It's just, as you said, a reminder. But as we think about the cross-disciplinary nature, 
And Eliza, you mentioned architecture. I do think that we have an amazing opportunity to diversify our ranks, just not in the architecture, but in the community activists or in the wide range of other disciplines. And again, going, going, kind of going back to that other question, how do we invite more people in? What, what do we need to do to become more welcoming? Because it takes a whole heck of a lot of people. It takes a real team to transform a place or to build a city for three million people. Um, I don't know how you, how you get uh, quotas and, and recruitment going in any, any of this format. My, my, my strategy is always just to seek out the best ideas. And uh, when I work, and I do a lot of work in Oakland now, um, what I see is that some ideas resonant, and the, the locals get it, and they're 100% with it. They didn't care whether Oscar Newman did, uh, 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 did all the studies on you know, eyes on the street. Eyes on the street makes sense, and the average person in, in the communities I work in get that. And, they, uh, and mixed income, I which is one of our postulates, um, is a tougher one. There's no question about it uh, as that happens because there's displacement. And so it's just an everyday rugged world. But I would also um, advocate modesty in this arena, a lot of modesty. There are so many things that are really driving these challenges that go beyond w even, you know, and, and we've never been modest about anything uh, in the CNU. But there are things that go well beyond it. In my experience in the low-income communities that we're working in, we're working in education. Uh, you know, preschool education, what, what Obama wants to accomplish there is really systemic. You know, unless these kids get early intervention and early education, their lives are going to be limited, you know, throughout. And it's a painful reality, but it's not a function of urban design. And the same uh, was driven ho home to me recently with one of the parents at our school was shot dead. Uh, and it's because of automatic weapons. And so, uh, you know, uh, handgun legislation is a big part of it. So there are so many things that are outside the realm of what we're dealing with. We all as citizens can be aware and cognizant, but let's not be too cavalier or, you know, if we just got the right membership, we'd be part of the solution. There's a whole lot of other debate, political debates that have to come down at a much more systemic level for these communities to get um, uh, healthy again. But there are underlying um, components that I think we can deal with, and maybe this speaks to the elite um, character or part of the organization, which is the underlying business of land, property ownership, who lives where, um, the real estate business, the f and in particular, the finance business. So maybe one radical thing which would come out of a discussion like that is to say, you know, depreciation is not a good idea. We've been living with that for many years in the tax structure, and it actually encourages people to leave investments, to sell investments, to think that investments, real estate investments have a certain timing, which doesn't have to do with, uh, which is not about sustainability or the long term. That doesn't speak specifically to the social issues we've just been discussing. But I think there's a world there that no one's really examining. I thought it would happen after the recession or as a part of the recession. And I don't, I don't know it. I don't know that world very well, except how it intersects with our work, um, working with developers. But um, I really believe that's one of the topics. I think there are many others. I think Peter's right. You know, there's certain things, especially in the realm of social issues, that the social arena that um, are much more complex, but there are other things that are actually generated by policy, which we've, ad we've addressed other topics at the level of policy, and maybe we could do that again. At least it's worth examining. So Liz, on your list of economic systems we need to deconstruct and reconstruct, the school system is a big one I'm seeing is, a th a threat's a strong word, but you know, just having friends who have had young kids and see them love their neighborhood and live in the city and now they're moving out. Yeah. This is, it's still an issue. And yes. we, I don't think we and have we, a And we did address that. Um, you know, John, John Norquist had that as part of his agenda for a while. So we uh, participated in that. Maybe we were not leading it, 
um, but we incorporated it in our thinking and our work, and you're right, the, w the, ba the battle's never over. Um, so that one in particular probably needs continuing work. But That comes up a lot, and I don't have it. Yeah, know. maybe what we should do is identify a few of these things and say we're always going to have a session about it. Or, But the, well, census, the census indicates that in, by the year 2025, less than 25% of the population will have school-age kids. Right, so when you look at the demo, and, and I, you know, I'm, I'm a mother, I have a child, and, and I moved out of the city because of the school, so I'm part of the problem. But when you are looking forward, right, if we are, hel I understand it's an issue, but if we can be surgical, if we need to uh, invest our resources, not only financial, but our people resources in those areas that will make the biggest change, is schools one of those? I I think we have right now a critical, because of this generational issue, we have a critical mass of people who are of that age where they're having small children um, in cities that we didn't have probably the last time this conversation was going on. So there might be an opportunity now that didn't exist then. I mean, I also think, you know, as a membership organization, um, we, you know, we've talked about we have a small staff at the head office that can only do so much, and that's a limited channel. You know, are there enough, uh, there are babies all around this week, if you haven't noticed. Um, are there enough people who are in that situation to form a working group on this topic because they're really passionate about it and we're not going, you know, no one's going to tell them they can't do that. Absolutely. How can we, <laughs> how can we do a very small amount to support it um, without diverting the resources we need to do these bigger, you know, more strategic things? So another question, uh, you know, along the lines of schools that I'm seeing a lot, uh, at least in Boston, because you know, walk down some of the streets and they're actually moving curbs in the wrong direction. So you know, Boston has a very rich, walkable culture, but we're still having, you know, in center cities, getting auto-oriented thinking. So that systemic you know, issue is still there. So. For me, it's how do we as, as urbanists or as this organization, as members of this organization, involve ourselves much more uh, seriously in infrastructure? And the, you know, I've seen a number of projects, oh, can now we hand it off to the big engineering firm and it falls apart. And so I think you know, that's, you know, there's two highway projects getting torn down in Boston and you know, we're doing some neighborhood planning adjacent to one of them and it's just they're not thinking about public life at all and they're not coming at the design of infrastructure uh, from a human scale. So I think us as, as CNU needs to look at what's happening in public life and placemaking much more seriously and then figure out how to con converge that on, on how we deliver infrastructure. I have one of the conversations that's also frustrated me being in this organization was um, you know, back to architecture. I think it's important, but the constant conversation around how do we capture the architecture schools um, when we also need to be worrying about capturing the engineering schools and the, plan, you know, the planning schools, I think to a large extent we have captured, but what about you know, the business schools? There are so many other bigger levers that we could be, that don't have an ingrained um, bias against us. They probably would be open to, well, maybe the engineering, but um, uh, uh, that would be open to these solutions potentially. Liz, can you please kind of address that? You came out of being a dean in an architectural school, so you understand better how we might be able to influence a wide range of education systems. Well, schools. you know, I think the people who've had the effect in the several schools are um, people from the CNU um, or some allied organizations like the Institute for Classical Architecture, which has started a certificate program at Denver. Um, and so, um, it, I think it really would behoove the engineers among us to see how they can be involved in the engineering schools. And so there are many more schools than there are probably um, individuals who could address that. But in some way we could, this organization could support that, but I think it's about developing the personal relationships with other, with people who are faculty. Uh, Norman. Garrick has done marvels at the University of Connecticut with um, guiding PhD students who are, will be the future teachers um, in those schools. And so um, part of 
what is important in academia is to develop a peer review venue um, that would recognize the work that's being done. So um, there's not much of that. I guess uh, in our world, maybe it's some of the trade magazines for planning. Um, Places is a peer reviewed journal, um, but for transportation, there are other journals. And so it might be actually addressing those, as well as individuals in schools, is addressing the journals to say, would you please encourage this kind of work? Because one doesn't advance in academia without that kind of publication. Um, in order to do the research and be recognized, it has to be published. Um, and so what we did with the ICAA um, was convince them that their annual publication needed to become a re peer review publication so that traditional architecture could be recognized in architecture schools. It'll take a long time to have an impact, but it's that kind of um, tactical thinking. Um, so Liz and Peter, I'm directing this question to, to you all, right? So you help uh, found this movement, just not this organization, but this movement, right? 25 years hence, you know, when you're sitting in, it, in your rocking chairs, um, on your front porch, looking looking at what what the next generation has done. What advice? What issues? What challenges would you want them to have addressed, or currently addressing? Thanks. Uh, I, I, I'm uh, for years. them. Uh, I'm for them figuring it out themselves. Really, I mean, you know, the idea of prescribing what the next step is, is exactly the wrong thing to do. <laughs> exactly the right thing to do is to see what you guys come up with. Because it's a different world and different set of circumstances, different set of entry points, uh, different set of priorities. So you've got to invent exactly where you go next. Uh, I've gone where I think I wanted to go, which was actually, you know, just one little tangent of CNU. I mean, regional planning and international stuff, that's one path. There's a million paths. So uh, it's, it's up to you guys. Back on you. But, but I think you can do much the same thing that we did. Sometimes it might seem as if we had the opportunity that there was so much obvious change that we could enter at any point. And, um, make some, have some forward action. Um, but I think you, you all, the next, everybody in the room can be looking at what it is that you are critiquing about um, the built environment, the way we deal with the natural environment, energy, finance, whatever the things that are really just bugging you because you see them happening in an unjust or stupid way every day and say, how do I enter this? Um, what can we do about it? And the built environment plays a big role um, in a lot of that, I think. So I think it's following your experience um, and, and looking for the, the way that you can enter it. I, I, you know, uh, tactical urbanism never occurred to me, and it's a great thing. And as a matter of fact, I actually already benefit from it. You know, one of the fatal flaws of our big master plan communities was what we had a fantasy about where retail should happen. And of course, retail has its own motivations and standards and it doesn't sit in the middle of communities. It likes to be at the edge where it can get lots of other people involved and then there's a taxonomy of it and with big and small. But, uh, and so, it, you know, it's always been the kind of challenging nut. Well, I've now been going to various design sessions with clients, and instead of doing standard buildings for retail, they're all coming up with this idea that you guys gave birth to, which is, well, why don't we just do some temporary structures? And, and you know, uh, and you know, we can just, and it'd be super low cost, and therefore, the businesses won't have to pay big rent, and we won't have to get credit worthy operators, and all of a sudden, we can have retail in different scales in different locations. And that all came out of this. So the cool thing is that there's just got to be constant uh, invention. And then it ripples in all sorts of complicated ways that are wonderful. So hold, hold on, I want because I want to have you guys a answer the question. Because I loved 
just love how you guys answered that. I mean, just so full of respect, so full of all the characteristics that have made this organization what it is, made this movement for what it is. And it, and it really strikes me that, that we are the whole because of the individual pieces. So Eliza, Russ, and Alice, I would love to have you, I know you all want to respond to what Peter said, but weave into that what your own personal goals are. Like what have you thought of where you're going to be working, what you need to be addressing? Not as the movement, right? Because when it all comes down to it, Liz and Peter followed their own path. So for you all individually, 20 years from now, where do you think, have you thought about that, and where do you think you will be working, and what are those issues that are most exciting to you? Um, personally, I'm just trying to get the pedestrian lights retimed in downtown Orlando, and you'd think that would be easy. Um, I, I do want to talk uh, sort of, uh, so I'm a little bit of an organi organizational geek. I think I caught that from Jen Hurley. Um, and so, uh, for organizationally, how we've gotten there thus far, you know, one of the ways that tactical urbanism, Mike Leiden was able to bring that forward was because we had this organization, NextGen, that was a platform for his ideas. And NextGen was around for a while before, honestly, uh, well, I was totally new, so I didn't have any good ideas at that point, but before there was an idea worth championing. But when that idea came along, there was a platform and there was a group of people to internally kind of peer review it and to champion it. Um, and so having these groups, and, and we're not, you know, the next gen activities that are happening, we didn't even know what was gonna happen. So we're not involved with that anymore. We have new, new younger champions doing that so that the process keeps going, hopefully. Um, uh, but having, um, having, I think that probably happened naturally, honestly, with the founders group because it was a small group and you were able to, I'm sure you peer review your ideas against each other in, in an organic way, but as we get bigger and bigger, finding that peer review group gets harder unless you happen to be in a firm that does that naturally. But you know, I was coming out of grad school and some of these some folks are working independently. So having these little peer review groups, whether it's the engineers group or whether it's a, a, a multidisciplinary group, um, to bounce ideas off of, to develop those ideas, and then to ultimately to champion those ideas is really important. So I come um, at a lot of urbanism from a standpoint of transportation. That's sort of my number one lens. Like I love that people care about housing and I love that people care about retail and I love that people care about these other things. But like to me, it's all about the moving of people and it's the public realm that people are traveling to and within. But I also understand that transportation isn't an end. Um, and I always want people just to be able to sort of move as they choose. So a lot of things that matter to me are choice. So I, I think in the future I want choice and really good movement. Most people think that choice and movement comes from their car and my natural enemy is the single occupancy vehicle. And I think a lot of people don't realize that when I'm biking through their neighborhood that I'm there to destroy their way of life. Um, d please, please don't tweet that. So, so I think the future is, I'm optimistic about the future for three reasons. One is that I recognize that my bubble is really small, that the fact that everyone I know doesn't think I'm weird that I ride a bike means that my world is really weird and not the norm and not the standard. And preparing for this and reading more of, like rereading Suburban Nation and thinking about some of the issues you guys have tackled, I honestly don't know a single person who lives in a standard sprawl development. Like, I don't know anyone who lives there. I don't even know what that experience is like. The people I am friends with have chosen to move to cities, to be in places where they can walk and drive and bike, and that it's all about choice. And so I think it's so important what you guys have done to build places that can do these things, because I just go to the places where you can do those things. I can't imagine choosing to live in a place where you didn't have choice of mobility. But I also think that technology is going to play a huge role. And what's so exciting for me is, you know, what does the autonomous vehicle hold? Does it make our city smaller and more dense? Does it relieve all of our need for parking? Or does it make us sprawl more? And I think we have to really be ready to tackle the policies about a technology like that that could change, for better or worse, so quickly, both how we get around and then how we build as a result of that. And I'm sort of poised to be like, when is the change? When is the change? When is the change? How can I fight the single occupancy vehicle of the autonomous vehicle? Because that car, that car is really bad. So um, 
that's sort of where I'm coming from. And I appreciate all the thoughts you guys have put into the built environment that can then provide for these different kinds of spaces. It's interesting how to listen to Alice explain that because um, Boston's in a weird confluence of events right now, I feel. And you know, for me, looking at the la the, what CNU has been doing, it's been about the container, you know, the building, the street. And now I think we're phasing into a, well, let's, what happens in those containers in a much more detailed and nuanced way. Um, so for me, I think, you know, Eliza kind of nailed it. It's about the small, I think, a lot right now, about the small things, the small solutions. But I think that is a different approach at the same problem. And, you know, we tore the charter apart a few years ago to see what do we still believe in this and are these still the values we hold true. I think the only thing that was in there that all of us kind of felt was still might be tricky is the mention of the car. And that, you know, that we should be organizing our built environment around transportation and not public life. And then the transportation should support that public life. So I think that is flipping, I'm hoping, for us. And, you know, the small solution is pretty, is, you know, the story that came to mind is, um, you know, they're studying BRT routes in Boston. Um, $100 million or so pilot project that they would probably never do another one. But they want to try it. And so we were at a meeting and talking about it. And I, I said, well, OK, it's $100 million. You're looking at several routes. How much time will they save from a fairly low income area of the city into downtown? One minute for $100 million. You can ride from that part of town on a bicycle into downtown in 12 to 15 minutes now. So what can you do with $100 million with bicycle infrastructure? And that small solution out of the five scenarios they were looking at was not even a thought. The small solution about you know, how do we improve our built environment for the person rather than just planning for a machine to move the people is, a, I think, a, it was a radical idea in the conversation at the time. But it comes back to this idea that you know, if we really think at a human scale, um, I think we'll be better off. So for me, it's just, you know, I think going forward, it's always like, well, where is that small tweak? How can we leverage the human scale to, to make it better? You know, I, I'd like to jump in on the autonomous vehicle. CNU's got to get ready for this. CNU's got to think this through. This is a, a really big, interesting, and potentially fruitful challenge. Parking now, search. I think uh, the, the research is already in. The, it will generate more sprawl and generate more VMT. I mean, there's some good studies done by Fair and Peers already on this. Basically, cars circling, waiting for something to do, or going off to a parking lot. The only thing worse than single occupant is zero occupant vehicles floating around. <laughs> and, uh, and there will be that. So, um, but the technology could be the next generation of BRT. So instead of buses with drivers rolling down dedicated lanes, you could have autonomous vehicles that are shared and always full, only operating when they're full, and platooning in ways that actually get you better than a minute of uh, travel time improvement because everybody goes direct to destination. There's every, every vehicle is a express train, effectively. So we've got to continue to be innovative thinkers about new technology. And there, there has been a certain complacency in CNU about technology. It's like we're we're for human scale and soft and people walking and biking and that's all great but there are old people there are people there are rainy days there are you know all sorts of situations that you need to think through and this new technology i think could really play in our favor but i think we've got to grab it and own it and direct it so I I so much right. for me saying you guys got to figure it out <laughs> no i think you're right cuz if you have if you think this through <laughs> Parking structures could go away, you know, housing cars could go away, but the car companies, I think, have to realize that to get the most out of their fleets of cars, they have to have people living in close proximity to each other, so they're not wasting trips. So I think we have to start to think this through as a, a viable transportation system that we add to the network. And a car share system. I mean, that's, that's one of the obvious solutions. I hope that study, well, I hope that study didn't take that into account because that would be a much brighter future than, um, than personal, than private yeah. autonomous vehicles. Um, so I, I have had the, the pleasure of asking all of the questions and I'd like to turn it over to, to you all to see what questions you wanna ask um, this amazing panel and, and the insights. 
The first question that came up about uh, techniques for implementation, what really strikes me is an awesome technique that wasn't mentioned but was all over Peter's presentation a half an hour before was the use of data. Um, Peter was into that 20 plus years ago. We were talking about design. He was showing demographic statistics. And a lot of my urban design friends who only wanted to talk about design were yawning I thought it was kind of interesting. I still was kind of more of a design geek. But 25 years later, I, I went to Peter's office a few months ago and I said, dude, you had it figured out back then. It's the data. That's what makes the point. So I would love for the group to maybe talk about how the kinds of things Peter just showed could be plugged in to just seal the coffin, put the final nails in the coffin of sprawl to show how quantitatively our solution is way ahead. I'm going to let someone else actually address your question, but I'm going to speak first as a former math teacher to say that when statistics bear out what you believe to be true, and I'd imagine that Peter showed slides of things that you've wanted to believe were true for a long time, and then he showed the data that said it was, people wholeheartedly agree. And when you show people data that tells them their world is not what they think their world is, they will wholeheartedly disagree. And so there is a balance in its use in education. And it's I will so, pass it on. That's so funny. I was about to say almost the exact thing. I, I have called myself data girl, and I am increasingly coming to the, to, the, to the conclusion that it's not data that makes your point. It actually is more the antidotal story, that powerful evidence. So, um, data was on one of my, on the list, too, because I think it's, it's something that we're not utilizing enough of. So Somerville is getting ready to do a whole public life, public space survey of the whole city and count the number of pedestrians walking, you know, count how many people are in parks to understand how people are using the city, not to, inf not to necessarily inform uh, the design, but to reinforce that the design for where things should occur and what people should be doing can be, um, you know, there's sort of an emotional reaction and then there's, okay, and then here's the data that also reinforces that design. So they're building a political campaign around improving public life and capturing the data to support that in a way. So I think we have to couple both the design and the art of the new urbanism, but with the data that supports it. And also the work that, you know, growing out of the work that actually Peter was involved in with Joe Minicosi and the work that Chuck Marone's been doing with Strong Towns and identifying the, um, the cost of sprawl and taking that to the level of the street and the development. Um, Tommy Pacello and Jen Krause in Memphis are actually starting to map that and see which areas of the city are performing well from a tax value basis and which ones are not. And in cities that are struggling financially, they're, gonna, they're probably not gonna have a choice other than to react to that information. And it's not what they wanna hear remotely, um, but it's hard not to, to follow the money. Before we move on, uh, you know, I think you're right about the, uh, the data being receptive to, to certain people. I think the power of urbanism is that there's enough data to satisfy everybody. In other words, so, and that's why I'm always fascinated by special interest groups. People tend to live in special interest groups, and they have one concern. And if you can hit that one, then you got that group, and then you hit another one, and you get another group. So, the, the, the receptivity is always there if you do the, all the co-benefits. If you rest it on one issue, transportation or carbon, then you're gonna get exactly what you're talking about. So it's the co-benefit analysis, which is unique to urbanism. It's the only strategy that has that quality. Well, I've been, I've been struck in listening to this conversation about how you know, we've had three scales, we've had three different ways, we've had multiple different ways of looking at it. It's always hard to narrow down the focus of the, of the new urbanism. And then you hear the debate about uh, elite, elite versus a broad group. Um, when um, wh when uh, the notion of platforms was raised, um, I thought that was, uh, that was, that was quite powerful. How you know, the CNU has prospered by, in its first 20 years, by 
allowing all sorts of nascent rebellions to exist within its ranks. Um, is that a model that will continue into the future? Um, how do we um, continue to create, particularly in a time when platforms and networks are the way that society is going, how does the organization continue to create that so um, our, our new president doesn't uh, collapse from overwork and overstress? <laughs> Well, one thing that I that I know that I think Lynn's been in, at least in part responsible for this year was taking all those revolutions inside the tent as much as possible and bringing, making sure all the next gen events were on the agenda and making sure the strong towns events were on the agenda. And there's a there's a different way of handling that, which is trying to exclude those because it's excluding competition. Because oh my gosh, the world will end if people don't show up to X event that's the official event. But the result is, if you do that, people just still don't show up to the event you wanted them to go to, and then they're outside the tent. So I applaud that this year, that that has been the approach. Um, and anybody else want to say? I, you know, so Hank, you, you, um, you raise a great question, and one that I've given a lot of thought to. Um, my, my philosophy on this is that we actually don't have any competitors. I don't think AIA is a competitor or APA or ULI. I don't think we have any competitors. I only think we have collaborators. I think that we need to own our special sauce in that we are the innovative thinkers. We're always pushing what is next, how to do it, the conversation around autonomy. I mean, I, I've, I'm just struck by all of your comments here. And what, how, what can we do to create a broad platform, a broad interconnected network where everybody becomes a collaborator, where we add our added value to a wide range of things, and then wide range of issues, topics, approaches, implementation, and then allow these other organizations to really scale it up or to move it forward. And in some areas, maybe we are the ones who scale it up or move it forward. And that is the way I think we're really going to accelerate the pace of change, is not try to own everything, but rather to create as big of tent as possible, as big as network as possible, to have a philosophy of generosity and openness, and I think that that will, that will help create more partnerships and really, again, I keep going back to it, but it's, what, it's this drumbeat in my head, accelerating the pace of change. How can we get more partnerships? Next gen, you wanna take all of this and go with it? Go, less work I need to do. You know, you allow you want to go take this one particular piece and run with it. Here's the piece you don't have that we figured out. Go run with it. And then constantly have these feedback loops. I've been really shocked lurking at the local level at how often people have been willing to put the CNU name on events, partner organizations. When we had n no financials to bring to the table, <laughs> um, when, we, when we had... Um, uh, you know, whether it's putting our, our, our logo on their mast, or on their party, or whatever it is, people are actually, have been really generous to us. I do think that we, um, in the past, and I don't know all the history, haven't done a good enough job of leaving breadcrumbs so that when the information that we originated goes out, that it, people can find it their way back to us. Um, and there are ways to do that that are as simple as, you know, and, and it has to be willing to do that if we just put the media kit together. So Hank, this idea of platforms, and I'm glad you brought it up again, because I actually think of the CNU as the platform. So in Boston, I have to kind of go behind enemy lines a lot. Um, you know, and, and the GSD, I mean, there's a number of folks on the stage today that went to the GSD, so I don't think we should talk about it that way anymore. Um, but so, I, you know, it's been interesting to think about, okay, how can we sort of put our camouflage on and deliver you know, plug into that platform in a way that we get mutual benefit with everyone involved, and values added. And I found in Boston that a lot of people are really receptive to that, and I think the chapter is kind of taking off because of people are saying, wait, that was new urbanism? Like, is that, is that what new urbanism is? And, that, and we're getting more and more people sort of connecting to the conversation that otherwise would have just dismissed it. So. You know, I made a suggestion to Lynn this morning, a concrete suggestion, which is that CNU ought to have a pres presence in every single conference that, sur that swirls around urbanism. So we should have a session at every AI a um, AIA, every APA, every uh, uh, transit uh, collection, every ULI. And not only is that a way of actually spreading the word, but it's an opportunity for the, the next generation of CNUers to get a voice and to go out and make the talk, you know, give the talks. 
and have the interaction and understand, as I was talking about earlier, understanding your enemies and understanding what they're thinking. Uh, so just having a place, a, a session, a CNU session at every one of these Congresses, I mean, excuse me, conferences, I think would be a powerful uh, enabling Assign strategy. Assign the board. What? Assign the board to do that. Oh, I the love board that members. Idea. Not, just, not just the board. <laughs> oh, no, no. It should be all the no, new members get, should be able to get up one. and give a speech at these things. And, yeah, yeah. you know, and uh, more and more people will come to them. You won't be able to demand plenary spots, but you can get a session, and then more and more people will come because they'll figure out that's where the cool ideas are. Let me just clarify my comment. Um, I think the board should absolutely do all those things, but there's so many magical people in, in here who are not on the board or not on the stage um, that we have way more resources than just the people on the board. But I, I think what I meant by that was that actually asking some one person to do the APA and another person actually identifying the people and asking them to do it on behalf of the organization is the way to do it. Well, and that's a good point because there are probably sessions at almost all of these organizations that um, are being done by urbanists, but uh, there's no breadcrumb. It's not, yeah, it's not it's a not CNU named. session. It's not named. Russell, do you want to say no, something? Okay, there, there's a question right here. And then Patty, and then that will be, that will be it. Okay. Thank you. I'm an urban designer and um, I'm, uh, of course, a, a huge, huge fan of all the uh, urban revitalization that's been, been part of my, my process. But I, I have a little bias here, probably because I live next door to Seaside. Um, and I would lo I'm looking forward to the day when we sort of circle back around. And I understand, I totally understand, hey, we're more than Seaside. Seaside's a really, really good model for a lot of these things still. And the green fields are still really important. And the big developments, I think, are still really important. Uh, talking about the tactical urbanism, you know, the, the small scale, you know, you guys, Robert. You speaking to the I'm sorry, Liz and, and, and Andreas and Robert and Daryl, we're all out there doing this stuff at the beginning of Seaside when there was nothing else to do but to throw Be some tactical. temporary buildings up, bring in some buildings on trucks. Anyway. I don't want to belabor the point, but I think it's still important, and I hope this organization will continue to uh, consider all that important. Uh, but that leads into point number two, which goes with the resorts and such. In, in terms of accelerating the pace of change, one of the things that I think the 30A corridor, the remarkable laboratory that it is, and I hate this word, but it's brought a sexiness to these places. It has, it has this appeal, and it's about the market, and it's about what, what really strikes at people's hearts. I'm as wonky as the rest of the crowd here, but ultimately, how do we sell the sex appeal of CNU? Well, you know, the social scientists will tell you there are three or four steps in social change. And the first one is to make the goal appealing. Um, the second one is to take the impediments out of the way of doing it. And the third one is to finally regulate it. And I think the new urbanism can point to um, many things that it's done, that it's made appealing, the smaller lot, the walkable place, the narrow street, whatever it is. Um, and those new places are important to have made those things appealing. Um, and now they're being regulated. Um, first, we had to get rid of the old zoning codes. But one can think of that in terms of energy use, water use, um, and it does take a while. but making it appealing in the first place is absolutely important. I, I live in Florida from South Carolina working on thousand acre projects, so I'm with you. And I get one thing that we do need to be careful about is as we're struggling to explain that we are relevant in the center city, which I think we absolutely are, to not, that those of us who are working and trying to fix the suburbs or the exurbs don't feel like we're getting left behind. Um, and I think, you know, it was great uh, what Peter said in the last session about car-free streets. And the magic that we bring to that is in the right place. And that's the magic that we bring to a lot of this. And, and the same with the car. If you are in a rural community, the car is absolutely and forever going to be a part of your life. And that's the right place for that. But if you are in the center city of a major, um, of a major metro, that's not the right place. Patty, 
hold it I'm up. too tired to talk about anything else. Um, Peter's point of getting into the, the tent and being in the places that are um, the, the different organizations, I think that that's absolutely critical for our steps. But I think we can, um, we don't have to go to the conference and get the big table to be starting to have the effect tomorrow night in New York City at the AIA, Mike Lydon will be talking about tactical urbanism. I think the more we look at those small places and get ourselves in there, I think that's what builds them asking us, can you come to our conference? We'd like to have you continue this, this, this discussion. That is, that is terrific, Patty, and I think I, I want to uh, thank everyone for their comments. It's one o'clock, I wanna be uh, respectful of people's times. Mostly, I just wanna have the last word to thank each and every one of you. I, I am always inspired by the members, but I'm particularly inspired um, and uplifted by this particular crew. So will you all join me in thanking them? Thank you.